Hey everyone, it's the Kung Fu Genius, aka Alex Richter, and we have a new deal for Kung Fu Genius fans. If you go to CityWT.com, you can buy any two of our apparel and get one free, and that includes the new City Wing Chun gym shirt, like the one I'm wearing in the new color. Any apparel, you buy two, you get one free, just go to CityWT.com and use the code KFGB2G1. That's KFGB2G1. Use that code at CDWT to get one free apparel with your purchase of two of anything, t-shirts, all that good stuff. And before we get started, if you could do me a favor and don't forget to like this video, comment on it, share it on social media, help us get the word out there. That's a tremendous help. And if you listen to us on audio, don't forget to review the podcast wherever you listen to it. And with that, Let's get started. All right, peeps. On today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will answer more viewer questions. Lots of gems, lots of context, lots of the Yoda and Palpatine reference might not be about you, my guy. Let's get to it. He is unstoppable, unbeatable, unbelievable. He's Alex Richter, the Kung Fu Genius. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Watch out. Word is, I'm a Kung Fu Genius. Practice all day like a genius. Martial arts, martial Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? Oh, man, I'm good. Yeah, doing What well, is going on today? Well, I don't have the sling on, but that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt like hell. The uh, oh. arm's still recovering slowly. Oh. But, uh, you know, getting mobility more and more day to day. Slowly, but surely? Yeah, surely? yeah. Okay. It's a tough surgery. Rotator cuff surgery. It's uh, it's a common injury in martial arts and lots mm. of sports. Um, this, the surgeries are quite advanced now, but the recovery takes a little bit of time. So it's going to be a couple months of kind of getting back into it. But Ouch. at least I have this podcast to keep me occupied. <laughs> yes, yes. At so, least the podcast is in effect. Yes. Yeah. So I figured what we do is uh, continue the Ask Me Anything series because, uh, well, one, I kind of like doing these. And the response to our first one was, was pretty great. People like it because within one podcast episode we cover lots of different topics sometimes i think if we do one topic and people like don't like that topic they might not listen to the whole podcast mm. but if we do an ask me anything you know in in one episode i might talk about six seven different topics yeah so you never probably... know what you're gonna get <laughs> exactly right. right life is like an ask me anything episode right you never know what you're gonna get <laughs> oh, so yes i have the chance to talk about different things so hopefully it, it might be a little bit more interesting plus people like to see especially if they've asked us questions they like to you know hear their name or their handle said yeah. on, on the episode so that's always fun to kind of interact one-to-one -one with the fans a little embedded bit embedded shout out like that's that. embedded not embedded is embreded. that even a, what? embedded <laughs> what's embedded is that <laughs> why is that word in your head that's what funny. is that well, what I is have, that i've had heard people refer to dre as the forest gump of kung fu so. <laughs> forest gump, of kung fu. <laughs> forest gump. <laughs> all right man so uh we um uh, on the last ask me anything episode i basically told people like hey in the comments below go ahead and write any questions you might mm -hmm. have for uh, the next episode, and also there were a few that we didn't even get to in the first one. So we got kind of a mixed bag, and of course these are coming from either YouTube comments on videos or from the um, Kung Fu Genius Instagram uh, page. So yes. uh, you guys who want us to talk about uh, things, you know, you can always comment on YouTube, especially on these episodes, because I'll whatever you comment on this episode. I'll answer that in the next one. And then also we'll put another post on the uh, Instagram and you guys can write your questions right, there if you prefer right. Instagram. So let's get to it, man. Pretty what straight do we got? to it. All right. All right. So first up, we got Aga. Oh, this is a good one. Agapito Bolas. I hope I said that right. All right. Yeah, you Agapito did. Bolas from YouTube. Okay. I'm training something in my school is called the Thunder Step. It's like an arrow step, but instead of doing one step at a time, you can do maybe a middle step and a step just for close the distance very fast. I don't know how to explain well because my English is not that good. My question is, have ever you heard about it? Well, he doesn't need to apologize about his. I mean, no. his English is clearly better than yours. Uh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, just by reading that, I mean, it was stepping up your skills a little bit there, right? It, it, 
I was learning a lot as yeah. I was reading. <laughs> You're like, like, whoa, wow, this is <laughs> yo, these words here. Going. These words here. Yeah. This is amazing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, well, obviously, I assume because he made reference to the arrow step that he's a WT practitioner. Mm-hmm. And he mentioned about doing a middle step in between um, or take basically taking a step in between rather than doing one step at a time. So I assume what he's actually talking about is what we call the passing step. Right. Now, in, in Chinese martial arts, uh, especially Southern styles, usually differentiate between two types of steps. One is called a half step. The other one's called a full step. A full step is whenever you essentially, like if you have the right leg in front and then you take a full step and then you have the left leg in front, right? So basically almost like taking one step while you're walking, right? And that's called a full step. Uh, normally in Wing Chun and in many other martial arts, you actually keep the same foot in front. So you take one step and either you drag your back foot or you you pop forward, however your style does it. Okay. And when you keep one leg in front, the Chinese call that a half step. And in, in English, we usually call that a shuffle. All right. Yes. So you have one leg in front, we call it a shuffle. You keep one leg in front. In Chinese martial arts, they call it a half step. Okay. If you switch legs, they call it a full step. Wing Chun has some full steps. We basically call it a passing step. We use it whenever our opponent gets too far away from us for us to use the normal shuffle step. Um, but it's something that you want to use sparingly because every time you sh- uh, you switch legs, you switch leads, there's always a brief moment in time where your feet are kind of crossing past each other. Mm. And in that moment, your base is a little weak. And if someone were to shoot in or kick you or do something in that moment, you might you might be a little bit vulnerable. So uh, Sifa Langting would, would teach the passing step, but it was one of those things that uh, we were supposed to use it sparingly. Yeah. And you really try to hustle and keep the person close to you using the... Uh, the shuffle step or the normal advancing step. So, but in terms of like it being called the thunder step, now my assumption, a lot of times in, in, in Europe, whether it's Eastern Europe or Western Europe, most of the WT practitioners there didn't really have any access to anyone who spoke Cantonese okay. you know, because there's not a lot of Cantonese people in, you know, with some exceptions in Holland, there's a pretty sizable uh, Hong Kong and Cantonese wow. population that, that, that lives in Holland. So you actually do find a fair amount of Cantonese speakers in Amsterdam, for example, but you don't at all That's in cool. Germany. And very rarely you would find like in Italy or Eastern Europe or places oh. like that. So that means that it was, I don't know, I always feel like a lot of these funny names you hear like, oh, the thunder step. Yeah. They're usually born out of people going to a seminar with Sifu Langting and mishearing something either that he said and not understanding his so English. So it's not nomenclature, right? Or or misunderstanding the translation. Uh, mm. Like I said before, sometimes when I was in Germany, I'd sit front and center. I would listen to Sifu Langting teach at a seminar, and they would have a German translator there. And the German translator, yeah, because a lot of Germans maybe they didn't understand English or they wouldn't uh, understand Sifu Langting's right. English because. We're in Germany. So Siva Langting would speak in English and then there would be someone there translating it. And I obviously speak and understand German and I'd be sitting in the front row and Siva Langting would say something and then the translator would translate into German and I would hear the German translation and I'd be like, that's That's... not at all what he said. (laughs) Or or that's mm, like the jumbled. Or, or maybe it was a literal translation, but it missed the actual meaning of what he said. And I, I would be like, ooh, this is... Like, uh, that's actually not at all what Sifu Langting said. And mm-hmm. that would be quite, and it isn't to talk bad about them, but, you know, if you didn't grow up with Chinese people and you don't understand how how they express themselves in English, especially if their English is a little on the rougher side, yeah. it's very difficult to translate that. Plus, everyone who's translating him into German, English is their second language as well. Mm-hmm. So you have what the Chinese call which is a chicken is talking to a duck. Okay? <laughs> like when two people don't understand each other, the Chinese say, right? And is chicken. You okay. know, it's like, is with, is a duck. So it's mm. literally a chicken and a duck are speaking to each other. All right? So there's a lot of miscommunication, right? And so I felt that a lot of times when, when he would get translated into German, there was a lot of... Um, chicken and duck speak mm. going on so mm. that probably and then so who knows there's someone misunderstands something mishears something or as is occasionally the problem especially in europe people make shit up yeah. all right i wouldn't call it a thunder step i'd call it a passing step so uh-huh. but good question all right so what it's do we cool got you next? had that advantage though to to understand german and chinglish at the yes. same time yes and english yeah three different languages there completely <laughs> different yeah uh, okay let's go to chris w from youtube Looks like uh, there's some some points here. All yeah, right. Four questions. Okay, four questions. Right, a four-parter. Yeah. 
What techniques and strategies do you recommend on dealing with larger opponents, especially since Wing Chun's origin myth tends to focus on the idea of fighting bigger opponents? Should we just stop there? And yeah, go, because uh, I'm looking here. It looks like all four questions are different. So mm. they're not four parters. It's literally four different questions. All right? Right. So we'll, we'll, we'll let it slide this time, right? <laughs> uh, okay, well, that, that's a good question. And of course, this is something that, you know, as martial artists... We have to look at these things realistically, right? So, you know, he, he asks him the question basically like what kind of techniques or strategies do you recommend with dealing with larger opponents? And also the origin myth of Wing Chun basically being that, uh, you know, it's about it was two females basically developed it or Yim Wing Chun learned it from her teacher who was a female and they kind of developed it specifically for her right. to fight against a male uh, unwanted a suitor bandit. or whatever, right? Yeah, whatever the story was. And truthfully... All martial arts have some variation or some claim to fighting people who are bigger and stronger because ultimately that's the thing that everyone is worried about, right? Yeah. You'll never hear a martial art that says we specialize <laughs> in fighting people who are smaller and weaker, okay? <laughs> I, I, or I should say at least I have since not heard a martial art that claims on that, right? <laughs> to this day, Although no. many martial arts do in fact practice that a lot, yeah. right? Uh, it, it's never the claim that, okay, this martial art is not a, effective, <laughs> and uh, we, we are only focusing on fighting people who are equal to or smaller than you, right? So to, to, be, to be fair and open, um, Wing Chun is not at all unique in this claim. I mean, if you go to oh, any no. karate website or you look at any basic history of karate, they're going to say, you know, this was developed so that they could fight against XYZ, mm -hmm. all right? This Kung Fu style was the you know, to fight against bigger, stronger, X, Y, Z, whatever it is, right? Tarantulas. Y yeah, it, it's not It's not a unique proposition for Wing Chun to say that. So it's funny because Wing Chun people often act as if Wing Chun is unique in that um, in that claim, right? Uh, Jiu-Jitsu makes the same claim. Lots of martial arts make the same claim, right? And so uh, it, it was interesting. I didn't even think about that myself. I once made that mistake as well. Uh, I, and I made that mistake to my uncle in Germany. So my uncle, he used to be, uh, so my <laughs> uncle is, um, he's a, um, he worked for Volkswagen in Germany in Wolfsburg, yeah. which is the headquarters for Volkswagen. And he's a automotive engineering guru. He actually, I believe he has some kind of doctorate in automotive design. Yeah. So my uncle is a, like a doctor. He's like in, in like automotive design or something like that. Right. And he retired many Dr. years ago. Drive. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Drive. Right. <laughs> and he's an wow. extremely intelligent person. He's one of those people this like is... you, you ever, you ever talk to someone who's just so brutally intelligent. You just feel so intimidated. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I don't want to say anything because I sound like an idiot. <laughs> I have nothing to offer this person on my, best day that never happens to me yeah uh, like on my best day on a subject this person knows nothing about i have right. nothing to offer them right <laughs> okay and so my uncle is one of those yeah, guys speaks english and oddly enough, my uncle practiced judo like back in the 50s and or 60s or 50s or something like that and he i believe was even in the newspaper in germany in berlin As because a, like, uh so, somebody had he uh, some no he had actually judo like he actually threw someone who Stop either tried to, to try to take someone's bag what? or tried to attack him or whatever. But he actually straight up judo tossed somebody <laughs> and it like made it into the newspaper or something oh, like that. Right. Oh, so, you know, I, 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 I come from I come from this martial arts stock. <laughs> right. Very clearly. Uh, and uh, I remember when I was you know living in Germany, and I was training Wing Chun and I visited my uncle there in Germany. And he didn't know anything about Wing Chun. And mm. um, he asked me, so what makes Wing Chun different from other martial arts? And I said the same thing. Well, Wing Chun's a style that, you know, focuses on using, uh, you know, focuses on fighting, you know, bigger, stronger attackers or using your opponent's strength against them. And he said to me, like, in this super clinical way, he said in German, I'll translate it for you. He says, all martial arts claim that. I meant, how is yours different? But he said it in such a dry way. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Where it was just like, uh -huh. and suddenly like martial arts is my wheelhouse. My uncle is an automotive guru, right? And he's kicking my ass in this conversation already, right? He's already kicking my ass in this conversation. So I realized, I was like, well, you know, he's like, yeah, because he had practiced judo and judo says the same thing or whatever. So in terms of that claim, mm. I don't actually give that claim a lot of credence because I think it's so universal among most martial arts that it's just kind of, well, to be fair, 
It's what they all say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the question is, well, whether this claim is true in general of martial arts or specifically of any one particular martial art. So in, in, all, my, in all my time training in martial arts, uh, I've, I've kind of come to a couple different conclusions. Now, if you have two people and one person has martial arts skill and the other person doesn't, okay, uh, then oftentimes the person who knows martial arts should come out on top. In theory, and I'm using very general examples. Okay. Okay. Uh, and if you have two people and one person is larger and stronger, but the other person is very skillful, the smaller person is very skillful in martial arts, the smaller person should still have a chance against a stronger but unskilled opponent. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Now, the problem is when you have a larger athletic and skilled opponent okay the smaller person would have to be at an extreme high level of skill to be able to handle a larger skillful attacker yeah. not even with ease just i mean they will probably get out still <laughs> jacked up but they could potentially win oh. all right and for example you have you have this in the old ufcs jiu-jitsu being a you know brazilian jiu-jitsu yep. being a classic example of that Hoist Gracie went in there with this this kind of idea, being the smaller person. That's why they picked him supposedly over picking like Hickson, who was more athletic. They wanted to show through Hoist that, you know, a, a kind of more averagely built person could fight right. these guys, right? But you would see, especially in maybe not so much in the first UFC, but in subsequent UFCs, that Hoist would win. But like he would still take his licks. And sometimes that those were just against, I know they were all of them were also martial artists, but let's be honest, in the early UFC, some of them were just tough guys. Yeah. And they were tough guys with not nearly the amount of martial arts training as Hoist Gracie. And he would still take his lumps. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think you have to look at that as a very instructive thing right there. If you have someone who is smaller facing someone who is larger, if that larger person has no skills or is not athletic, certainly they have a chance. OK, if the larger person is athletic, it's starting to get harder. And it also uh -huh. depends where their athleticism is. OK, if the person is athletic and has martial arts training, the smaller person, I think, is going to struggle unless we're talking about a top tier elite fighter. Let's say someone small like Mighty Mouse Johnson. Yeah. But fighting someone who's maybe 170 pounds who does MMA, but not at UFC caliber. Mm, you see what I mean? God. So there you still might have a chance, right? Of course, for practical self-defense, people always need to be reminded that they're not fighting high-level martial artists, right? The, the idea of how, how do you solve the riddle of fighting someone who knows XYZ style, that is, a, that is an interesting thought experiment for people who don't martial arts, right? People who practice martial arts want to know that, right? That's a very interesting thing. For self-defense, it's different because self-defense situations start off differently. Yeah. Uh, there are other elements and factors involved that do not exist in a one-to-one -one contest. And again, I'm not the guy to say, yo, I train for the streets. Uh, I don't train for the ring. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm not that guy. And I've discussed that on many other podcasts, right. but it is a very different kind of thing. So a very skillful person who knows how to attempt de-escalation, knows things about body language, has good experience, knows what you know, that no matter what they know, they could still end up getting hit, but they have to keep fighting anyway. They could have a chance against someone who is larger, provided that person is not equal to or greater skilled than them. I mean, even yeah. Chinese martial arts has the saying, within the same family, within the same level of skill, the larger student wins. Mm. It's just that way, mm. okay? Because the smaller student would have to be at a much greater level of skill to compensate for what they lose in size wow. right and but that's, that's just deep. but that's just the way it is i mean even in the old chinese you know because chinese martial arts often get thought of as being uh, they all just believe in some weird fantasies and stuff but that is a very old chinese motto that in the same school same level of skill you win by size how, do you, how does this i don't remember the exact formulation but Samo Hung says it in prodigal son Ooh. because uh, when he's okay. teaching yun biu's learn jan character mm. Uh, I, I believe Yun Biu asked him, like, oh, if you fought my Sivu, meaning Leung Yitai, who would win? And then he says, ah, well, you know, same school, uh, same skill, you win by size. So, of course, I would beat him. You know, uh, so he says it in okay. there. It's a very common thing. <laughs> so um, that is just a fact. 
So I think one, you have to think about, uh, you know, the problems of self-defense and how to overcome them and developing your skills. And people need to stop thinking that the solution to fighting someone who's bigger, stronger, or more skillful is a matter of collecting little tricks. All right. Because that's the problem. People mm. think, oh, I know these little neat little tricks to get around this or the guy, you know, like all these internal martial art guys showing how they can stand there when someone pushes them and does all this stuff. And they really think that that is going to equate to someone who is not going to push their arm on the street. They're just going to be swinging wildly for the fences. Right. And it's going to be a very different thing. Now, I'm not saying that that doesn't require a high level of skill. The problem is that if I stand there and let you push my arm, invite people to come and try to push my arm and I can show how I can root my stance to the floor, no one can can push me over. That is nothing more than a demonstration of the ability to transfer force into the floor and avoid taking it into your body. That is not a demonstration of how you stop someone who's trying to rip your face off. All right. And unfortunately, people think it's the same claim. All right. Mm -hmm. People who practice that think that that then equals the same thing. So um, it was a bit of a roundabout answer, but there are no real techniques and strategies in dealing with larger opponents. You should train with everyone in your class as if they are bigger than you. Yes. And this is a big problem. See, sometimes my stronger, more athletic students outpower the junior students and outmuscle them. And I go, great, you're reinforcing using strength against someone who's weaker than you. The moment you run into someone stronger than you, you're, you're gonna be forcing it. So my advice is to train with everyone, even the person who's much smaller and, and weaker than you as if they're bigger and stronger than you. So it's more of a mindset. So mm -hmm. what was the next question? All right, so the second is, ooh, I'd second the question of learning more about your experiences learning with Lung Ting. Uh, so I guess that question is about me telling stories about learning from Sifu Lung Ting. Well, that was a nine year period in my teaching career. And there are a lot of stories. I don't know. That's probably an entire podcast right there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that be yeah, because the, you know, would be lots of stories. I mean, there's no, and there's and there's no one story or no one word or statement I can make that would encapsulate the entire nine years because, like every relationship you have, you there are ups and downs and there's like revelatory moments and there's moments you wish you could forget and so um, that's probably another podcast in itself. I think the uh, the stories of you in the car with him are, are pretty pretty good yeah lots of funny stories <laughs> all right third part what do you think of the rattan ring do you use it and how if so is it useful so the rattan ring is something that keeps coming up in wing chun because it's like uh you see it sometimes in movies and i know like back in the day in the 90s uh sifu randy williams made a video um where oh, he kind of yeah. shows how to use it right um so I actually wrote about this in, in my new book, my new wooden dummy book, which is, is in production right now. It's in the editorial part. I write about Kung Fu people need to stop wanting to get good with gimmicky nonsense. OK, because like if, if you look at you know, let, let's just take a kickboxer. All yeah. right. What does a kickboxer do? They practice shadow boxing. They practice their techniques. They do things in isolation. They do pad work. They hit a heavy bag and they spar. And then they probably also have a regimen of strength and conditioning. That is a very, and I use kickboxing in a very generic sense. Mm -hmm. That is a very generic way of looking at your martial arts. You need to do some solo stuff, whether it's shadow boxing or in Wing Chun's case, form. Uh, you need to do some technical training with a partner, you know, getting better at certain moves and techniques and things like that. Uh, you need to train your power, you know, pads, focus mitts, uh, you know, you hit the heavy bag, right? You need to spar so you can see what works and what doesn't and kind of tune yourself up. Okay. And uh, you also need to have probably some kind of strength and conditioning regimen to, and or something to keep your body fit for that sport. That's pretty much a, in my opinion, a template for training any martial art. The problem is that in Kung Fu, because of years of movies and all sorts of stuff, there's so much gimmicky pardon my friends, bullshit attached to training Chinese Kung Fu. You know, instead of just training your balance against someone who's just trying to push you or grab you, you got to do it on the plum blossom poles, right? Uh, instead of, uh, you know, training your elbow power using the wall bag, you have to put rings on your, on your wrists, mm. you know? And like people always look towards the 
sensational looking training methods like the accuracy of the kicks oh let's make a little ring and kick through and um, let's let's snuff a candle out with our punch or with the kick and like that stuff <laughs> is cool don't get me wrong on instagram people get a lot of likes on that kind of stuff or whatever okay but i really believe kung fu people need to stop thinking that the reason why they're not why they lack a certain skill, whether it's punching power or reaction in a fight, is because they just haven't found the right gimmicky bullshit tool to use. Like, my chi sao is okay, but if I practice with a rattan ring, yeah. oh man, people, oh. I'm gonna be untouchable. Ten all right? notches up. Yeah, yeah, mm. and, and they, th they put way too much stock in these kind of things. Mm. First of all, a lot of these really gimmicky training methods, whether it's a rattan ring or um, wearing rings on your wrists or uh, using those things where you do like the uh, it's like um, it's almost like a, a bice like a bicycle chain where you put your hands in there for speed on the punches and stuff oh, like whoa. those are things you can use when you've been training for a few years. You're already very skillful and you've plateaued. What happens is that even like when you see professional fighters using gimmicky things, mm. What they're doing is they're often doing it, one, like in the case of UFC fighters, you see them like sprinting with parachutes on and stuff. And most UFC fighters, they call that kind of training sexy training. And that sexy <laughs> training is what they do when the UFC videos come to show, oh, how are these dudes training in preparation for their fight? So they're there throwing all sorts of things and doing all sorts of stuff that looks really cool because that looks great in those highlight videos. But the truth is, what the UFC fighters are doing day in and day out is pad work, bag work, sparring, and plain Jane strength and conditioning. Yeah. But when the cameras come, okay, they're going to run with the parachute and they're going to do, you know, all the things with the hammers <laughs> and all that kind of stuff and jump off here and do gymnastics and all that all kind of trees. stuff, right? Because, because that looks way cooler, right? And it's not to say that they don't do that, but those kind of training methods are normally done for elite level athletes who, need, who are already maxed out in the standard methods and they need just a little edge and a little bit of novelty to give their nervous system a different look. Okay. Most Kung Fu people haven't even, pardon my French, dipped their in training methods of the style that they do before they already want to look for these gimmicky hacks. It's like, how, huh. much, how, how often do you really hit the wall bag a week? Mm. How often do you really actually train chi sao with a partner? How often do you really spar and have someone throw punches and kicks at you? If, if that is not a question you can answer quickly because it's something you do regularly, mm. forget about the stupid rattan ring. Mm -hmm. Forget about all these stupid kung fu torture devices you see in Shaw Brothers movies. <laughs> thinking that, oh, I, I need to have a, a pole dummy to improve my uh, long pole. I need to have, uh, you know, something, you know, for the, these these light, you know, now they have like the boxers have those light wheels where it's like you stand in front of it and the lights pop up and then you hit it. That's awesome. All right. Like every, a light pops up and then you have to punch it. It's almost like playing whack-a-mole, but for punching. Yeah. That stuff's super cool. But guess what? If you're a beginner or a journeyman or even someone that's done martial arts for five, six years, you don't need that. You need to hit a bag. You need to spar. You need to do regular plain Jane, unsexy grunt training yeah. and stop Keep thinking that, you know, oh, the, even the wooden dummy is not good enough for people sometimes. They need to make it an octopus dummy and put eight arms on it or they need to have it with a spinning base or they need to do Ooh. No, man, plain Jane standard wooden dummy. If it was good mm. enough for IP, man, sorry, yip, man. Yeah. It's good enough for you. You don't need to put extra elongated arms and do all stuff, stuff that looks cool. I get it. It's the social media era. You do that stuff because you get a lot of likes. But that stuff's not going to help you stop someone from smashing your face in with a fist. Uh -huh. And so when I was a teenager, I remember looking in the Inside Kung Fu magazine and I saw that Sifu Randy Williams, famous Wing Chun Sifu, had yeah, a video, video on how to use okay. the rattan ring. And it looks so cool. Did you order there. the video? I did. Uh, I don't know if I ordered it or I just bought it at the local martial arts store, okay. but I, I think I got it at the local martial arts store. I yeah. bought it and I bought the rattan ring. And then I went back to my house, to my apartment. Oh, oh, oh nice. And I watched the video and I taught myself how to do it. And basically it's just doing things like bong wu and gan sao and you got to kind of keep the, the ring between your wrists or whatever. And I watched the video and by the end of the video, I, I could do the whole thing. It was like super easy to pick up. It wasn't anything that like required a lot. It wasn't difficult to figure out. 
And then I used that thing for like a week and I did the different combinations and then I think put that thing on the shelf and it started collecting dust ever since. It, it, so in other words, it wasn't like a huge revelatory thing for me, right? It looks cool. And when you do Kung Fu, people like to see you training with bamboo things and stuff like that, right? Okay. But uh, it, it does have a liability because in order to keep the bamboo ring up, you actually have to press out. So it actually trains your pressure to go in, in many cases, in the exact opposite direction that it would go in if you were using these movements and applications. So Ooh. I would say it's actually ruinous to your wing. I wouldn't say it ruins your wing chum. Let me, let me just say in the long list of things you could buy yeah. to improve your wing chun, the first I would say a pair of gloves yeah. for hitting the bag and sparring and a mouthpiece and, uh, you know, all the way down to rattan ring, all right? Rattan ring would probably be about 356 on that list. On that list. Okay? Gotcha. There's lots of other things you can get, all right? A five-pound dumbbell would be yeah, way, way, way higher up on that list. More beneficial. So there you go. All right, all right. Uh, let's go on to the next or the fourth, right? Do you know any stories about Yip Man's time as a police officer? Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, truthfully, uh, obviously, th there are a lot of people who are probably way more qualified to answer these kind of questions than I am. Uh, all I know about Yip Man's time before he came to Hong Kong in 1949 is the stuff that's written in books. Like, I, I don't have any mm. insight into, like, anything I know about this is from a book that anyone else could have read. So, in other words, like, I don't have any special insight on this because, truthfully, when Grandmaster Yip Man was in Hong Kong, he didn't really like to speak about his time in China before, especially in the time, let's say, in the last 20 years before he came to Hong Kong, because that was a very turbulent okay. time in China's history. And uh, Yip Man was a member of the Kuomintang Party, which was the became the opposing party to the communists. And that's one of the reasons why he had to leave. So spoiler alert for Yip Man 1 fans, he didn't leave <laughs> China because of the Japanese. He left because of the communists. But right. good luck putting that in a movie. Yeah. All right. We love China. Uh -huh. So uh, it had nothing to do with the communists. It had everything to do with the Japanese. Yes, that's right. Everything to do with the Japanese. So uh, he didn't talk about much about that time period, right? Uh, and, you know, so we don't know. Really, Grandma Sheet Man's life before 1949 is a big mystery. We only know some things, some things that his sons have told. Mm, There's not okay. really, there are no photographs that exist of him, as far as I understand, from before he came to Hong Kong. But supposedly he was a police officer. Now, the young Yip Man came from a very wealthy family. I mean, his family owned businesses, which included, they even owned businesses in Hong Kong. They were in Fatsan. They owned businesses way in Hong Kong. Yeah. So this is a very wealthy family. So what I understood, from what I understood, from what people have told me, he worked as a police officer not very, in not a very serious way. He did it as a job because he's basically bored. I mean, he has wow. money. I mean, he doesn't have to work for money. All right. And so uh, he, there's famous stories about him stopping, you know, the, the gun barrel from shooting, which is actually in the first Yip Man movie. But it wasn't a policeman. It was a robber. Supposedly that was a true story. <laughs> um, but I've okay. even I've even heard, although I cannot substantiate this, that as a police officer, his job was actually to make sure that the prostitutes had paid their taxes. OK, so he was basically a glorified tax collector. Now, I heard that. OK, now, the is that true? Man. I don't know. It's one of. How many stories I've heard about him, right? So truthfully, I don't really know that much about it. All I, all I seem to understand is that his job as a police officer, like he wasn't like, he wasn't like Dick Tracy or Sherlock Holmes. Mm. He, he worked wasn't a top from, cop. Yeah, from what I understood, he worked as a police officer because it kept him from being bored because he, he was a person of means. Wow. All right, moving right along. Uh, Nick from CT. Oh. This is by email. Okay, did you see Sifu's response video to your Castle Stories episode two? <laughs> uh, actually, I did not watch it. Um, and here, here's the reason why. Okay. So I, I don't really have that much time. All right. Yeah. People like people always go like, oh, have you seen this? Have you seen that? Have you seen this? It's like I see the most relevant stuff. I don't really have a lot of time to, I don't have a lot of time to spend on YouTube and watch videos. Okay. And usually if, if you look at like my playlists on YouTube, I watch like lots of uh, car stuff and I watch lots of uh, strength and conditioning. And uh -huh. I also watch like, 
mm, lots of Star Wars stuff, all right? And like <laughs> MCU stuff, all right? Yes. You would actually, I, I watch, a, I consume a very small amount of Wing Chun videos. First of all, most of the really cool stuff I've already seen, I mean, most of the relevant stuff. Right. And a lot of what people say out there, here's the problem with YouTube, and I'm on YouTube now, and I'm also part of the problem, admittedly. When someone says something on YouTube, people always feel like you have to respond to it, all right? And and there's there's no, you don't have to do anything. It's YouTube. It's and I don't, care if they, I don't care if they don't respond to it and I don't care yeah. if they do respond to it, all right? It just people feel that like uh, it, it, it's something that's, nece it's not necessary, all right? Spending, improving yourself is necessary, all right? Learning how to not let people live rent-free in your head is necessary, yeah, all right? It is necessary. Spending time with your friends, your family, that's necessary. Yeah. Giving a crap what people say on, on YouTube is not necessary. Now, having said all of that, part of the reason why I didn't even watch the video is because uh, he was responding, I think, to our second Castle Stories video where I was talking about Sifu Lang Teng. I, I, you know, I didn't even mention his name in the video, but he outed himself, right? So whatever, uh. right? I talked about uh, Sifu Lang Teng teaching him way back in the day when Sifu Lang Teng wasn't supposed to because he had essentially an agreement with the European Wing Chun organization that he wouldn't teach European students without permission. And he was teaching without permission, right? And the reason why he had that permission is because Sifu Lang Teng had effed up in the past a number of times, right? Yeah. And here he was breaking the rules, you know, biting the hand that feeds him as always. And rules ends up leaving him and starting his own association yeah. and uh, uh, essentially being the biggest pain in the ass for Sifu Lang Teng as well. So Sifu Lang Teng, he's a big fan of saying, oh, this is the what so called karma. Well, guess what? <laughs> was your karma. All right. He hurt Lang Teng a lot in the pocketbook. Right now, <laughs> might not like to hear that, that he hurt Sifu Lang Teng financially, or maybe he doesn't care. But that's true. Now, from what I understand, he made a video about talking about why he left or whatever. And here's the thing. My video was not really about him. As a matter of fact, dude, I'm going to show you something crazy. Uh -huh, uh -huh, all right. You know how I found out that I had made a video? How? Because our video came out on Monday, on a Monday. And by Tuesday morning, I woke up to a goddamn novel from on my phone. I mean, you would need to. He I texted you. He texted me. About, Ab the about video. Yeah, ab about my video and that he said that he had made a video. So here's the thing. Before he even had a chance to talk to me about it, he already published his response video, okay? Uh, and so most of what he talks about in the video, he 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 wrote a freaking novel to me, right? And I don't know, it's like, wow. I don't really have time for this shit, but yeah. he caught me. I had just, I was in bed. So he caught me at like the one time. So I just scanned through it. So you just woke up. Yeah, but dude, saw... yo, check, read this, read this. All right. Look how long that is. Look how long that is. That's so, uh, come on, man. Jesus. Damn. And look, all he is is talking about, oh, why he left. Like, I don't care about that because he wasn't even the main thing. But look at the bottom. I'm, I haven't gotten to the bottom yet. Okay. Wow. <laughs> the Yoda Palpatine. The Yoda Palpatine reference. <laughs> so he says in this text to me that he doesn't appreciate, you know, the dark things I said or whatever, right? Wait. And I'm no, like, and, and that, so, that I, dude, I was about... half asleep when I read this thing, right? And I'm like, dark things? What are you talking about? I basically just said, it was about Sifu Lang Ting teaching people he wasn't supposed to. It wasn't about him, right? It's like, it reminds me of my daughter. It's like, uh, enough yeah. about me. What do you think about me? It's right. not all it about, about you. Sorry to disappoint oh, you. It's no. not all about you, right? You made that whole episode about yeah. him. So here's the thing. He goes like, I didn't appreciate the dark thing that you said about me, right? And I'm like, what dark thing, right? And then it was funny because I was texting with him back and forth in the morning, like after this novel came in, right? I yeah. woke up to this novel and then, and then like, you know, how like on WhatsApp, it shows you when people are typing. And then like, so I write, and then he answers me back really quick. Right. And then, and then I go, what are you talking about? And he goes, the, the Star Wars, the Yoda Palpatine thing. And then I'm like, the Yoda Palpatine reference was about Sifu Lang Teng. I had compared Sifu Lang Teng. I said, everyone wants him to be Yoda. But he's actually right. Palpatine. He's like very twisting and wants mm. you to do things for him and wants to, you know. And this dude <laughs> thought that that reference was about him. <laughs> now, you don't, you don't even need to know any of the people involved to know that the Yoda Palpatine reference was about Sifu Lang Teng. 
This dude thought it was about him and then made a whole video <laughs> responding wow. before talking to me. I didn't find about to the next one. You know what's funny? You text with someone, they answer you back right away. Yeah. And I go, the Star Wars thing wasn't about you. And then you see Wade. <laughs> he, see, <laughs> he sees it. A little. The response isn't coming right away. It's like, oh, uh, dude, oh no, it wasn't about you, right? Ah. And I don't, I don't know what he said in the video. Uh, you'd have to hold a gun to my head for me to man. give a shit about it. But I yeah, so but I thought that I was super funny, Maybe man. I'll the freaking baby you know. mama drama here, all right? Wow. So anyway, uh, I, wow. I didn't. I so to answer the question, I do know about it though. I didn't take the just, time to watch just it. Haven't gotten Gee, to I've, see it. I've way too much respect oh, for my free man. time. Man, okay, all right. Shad Scott from YouTube. Hi, Alex. Have you ever cross-trained in or considered cross-training in JKD? That's a great question. Um, when I was a teenager, before I got into WT, I actually did, I guess you could say, a semester of Jeet Kune Do. Wow. Uh, because I was doing the non-classical Wing Chun, and I was getting interested in, you know, in, in classical Wing Chun, but I also wanted to see something about, you know, what was Jeet Kune Do about? Now, mm -hmm. as you know, and as I talked about in my last episode with Vincent, uh, Vincent Benitez, you know, in Jeet Kune Do, there's a big schism between the OJKD and the JKD concepts, right? The original Jeet Kune Do people are the people who basically want to practice the art as Bruce Lee did it, all right? Yeah. And then the Jeet Kune Do concepts are the guys who want to look at Jeet Kune Do as a philosophy and a concept and, and you know, integrate or mix or what, you know, I'm not going to get, in because whatever word you use, both sides don't like it, all right? But let's just say, People who want to do it in a more traditional to Bruce Lee kind of way yeah. and people who want to like say, well, every art can be put together into a concept that's called Jeet yeah, Kune Do, right? Yeah, I, I did like a semester in yeah. the concepts. And so I, uh, I, I did, uh, when I was living in the Seattle area, there was a community college that had a, um, a Jeet Kune Do class and they, it was like a continuing education. It was an ongoing thing. The guy mm -hmm. didn't have a school, but he taught at a community college and yeah. they, he, he would do it in semesters. And so I signed up for it. It was like Jeet Kune Do, come learn Bruce Lee's martial art. Oh, so wow. I did a semester of it. And it was great because it was the first time I got to spar because I'd been doing non-classical Wing Chun from the kind of James DeMille, Ed Hart lineage of Bruce right. Lee's Seattle days. And it was the first time uh, I got to spar with people outside of my school using the wing. Well, it might not have been the first time because I did have that jujitsu fight. Yeah. Um, but it, I think it was the first time uh, striking primarily striking based sparring. Okay. And it was great. I had a really good time sparring with the Jeet Kune Do guys. And I remember uh, sparring with those guys. And it was it was crazy because, first of all, I came from a Wing Chun school. It was very regimented. Like, you learn your basics and then you do progressive sparring. And more, like, like the non-classical Wing Chun school that I came from had a very intelligent way to teach sparring. You would learn the individual techniques. You would you would progressively add resistance. And then once a month, you had, like, a sparring day where you just Ooh, went for it, out. put all the equipment on, yeah. and you did it, right? And so I was used to hard sparring and used to regular sparring. And here I was in a Jeet Kune Do class and it was crazy because it met once a week, but it was like, okay, this week we're doing some boxing drills. Next week we're doing something from Salat. The following week, it's something from Filipino martial arts. The mm -hmm. following week, it's something from Wing Chun. The following week, it's something from fencing. And so, and again, and I'm not saying that this is how all Jeet Kune Do or Jeet Kune Do concepts are taught. But for me, there was like, there was no thread. It was like week to week, I was taking a seminar in something different yeah. and unrelated to what I did before. All right. But the guy would just let us spar for 20 minutes at the end of every class. So <laughs> okay. it was like, I would go to this hour, hour and a half class. And I remember one class, he was teaching us how to fight with a handkerchief. And like, it was like some Salat stuff or whatever. Oh, it what? was some cool stuff. But in terms of like learning... There was no, there was no progression. There was no thread. It was like a bunch of disjointed stuff. Yeah. And, but I, I kind of like would suffer whatever the hell the guy felt like teaching to do that last 20 Keep minutes 20 of sparring minutes with those guys. Right? Okay. Cause I, and I actually got complimented from his guys. He was like, Oh, you do Wing Chun or your infighting is really good and all this kind of stuff. And that's when I, I, I felt like, okay, maybe I, I do have some kind of skills or whatever. All right. uh, and we sparred with almost no equipment. It was off the rails. I mean, of course, I was a teenager then, right? <laughs> yeah. so I, I, had, I was 16, 17 years old. I had my license so I could drive there. Wow. And we're like punching each other. This is with what, 97 maybe? Something like that. Yeah. We're punching each other, kicking each other, like no equipment on, oh, getting all what? bruised up and stuff. But it was, it, it was what it was, right? Yeah. And it was a learning experience for me. But I thought that the instructor was 
a little all over the place. Now, he was a student of uh, the late Larry Hartzell. Larry Hartzell was mm. a Jeet Kune Do instructor. I believe he even learned from Bruce Lee from a short for a short time period, but was in with the Inosanto guys. And he was like the grappling guy. And he was one of the first guys in JKD to kind of start to integrate the grappling into the stuff that Bruce Lee had taught. And he's a couple, he had a couple books. And I remember like the one thing about that semester of JKD I took is I, I thought that the instructor wasn't really that good. <laughs> like I like I oh, I, wow. I liked the fact that I could train and I thought some of the guys who trained there were better than the instructor. I actually found Larry Hartzell's email address and I sent them an email to say that this guy is claiming to be a student of yours and I don't really think he's that good. Oh, and Larry Hartzell, uh, who passed away a number of years ago, he answered my email and he was really super sweet. And he's like, thank you so much for telling me about that. I'm sorry that your experience wasn't like this. He is one of the instructors in our association. I'll look into it and so yeah. on and so forth. But he was not um, defensive or anything like that. And and so I always thought that that was, I thought that was cool. very impressive how he handled it. So, um, but that's about, you know, and since then, I mean, obviously I've read all the John Little books on JKD, read Tao of Jeet Kune Do and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I know about Jeet Kune Do and I, I I've studied it from the books and stuff like that. But the only real hands-on training I had in Jeet Kune Do was that semester back in Seattle back in the day. Nice. Next up, we got Aeong Chin from IG. What are your favorite spots to hang out in Hong Kong? Wow, that's a great question. And you wow. have hung out with me in Hong Kong. We so, uh, have hung out in Hong Kong, yes. So... I'll first give the lazy answer on that. Um, I did an episode of Dudes of Kung Fu with uh, Big Sean uh, probably maybe two, three years ago where I did an entire episode on like... If Hong you're, Kong if, spots? If you're like a Kung Fu, like a Wing Chun or Bruce Lee nerd, these are like the places to go to, like Wing Chun <sighs> Athletic Association or Ching San Monastery, stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I've actually already... I, I did pretty much an entire episode of Dudes of Kung Fu. Now... I don't know That's what lit. season it was. I don't know exactly what episode it is. But if you go back and and look at like the last couple seasons of Dudes of Kung Fu, there's like a Hong Kong episode. Or in the description, it says I talk about, you know, when we where to go when you go to Hong Kong. So hmm. uh, to a certain degree, I've actually already done this here. Now, of course, Hong Kong is one of my favorite cities. It's probably my second favorite city after New York. I understand you've right? been there more than you've been to Brooklyn. I've been to Hong I've been to Hong Kong more times than I've been to Brooklyn and I live in New York City. <laughs> a fact that I'm quite proud of. Uh, I'm a queen I'm a Queens dude. So uh <laughs> so Hong Kong's got no tons offense of, to Brooklyn. Yeah, Hong Kong's got tons of places to hang out. All right. And of course if you're a martial artist, well, then whatever martial art you're into, not just Kung Fu, but nowadays Hong Kong's got obviously Thai boxing, mixed martial art gyms. So there's tons of places to train in Hong Kong, whatever you're into, right? So for me to give suggestions on Wing Chun schools, well, if people are from the Wong Sun Leung lineage, they'd probably want to go to those schools. If they're from the Leung Ting lineage, they'd want to go there. So yeah, it makes sense. So that stuff's easy to find when you go to Hong Kong. In terms of my favorite spots to hang out, so I'm going to say hang out, right? He says hang out. So I'm not talking there. So I'm assuming yeah. not talking about training. We're not talking about anything. It's like literally places to hang not out. Not Kung right? Fu Park. Yeah, not we Kung didn't, Fu Park. We didn't hang Although, out in Kung Fu Park. We worked. Uh, yeah, Kung we Fu worked. Park. Yeah, Kowloon Park is a great Cow place to hang yeah. out. Yeah, um, I like to hang out in Mong Kok. Mong Kok is great because you got lots of little shops oh, there, lots sneakers. of little restaurants. Sneakers Street, oh, right? The sneakers. Yeah, Woo! yeah. If you like sneakers, you yeah. go over there. Um, Hong Kong's funny because everything is a mall now. Mm -hmm. Like every other place is like oh, a mall. What was that mall we went to? We just had a blast. It was the, not the one that we we had the Tony 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 debate going on K11, K11 yeah K11. K11 mall not that one the other mall the close other, to did we you you by when you go to Hong Kong you can half of the MTR stations dump you off inside of a mall so <laughs> you, you can't go to Hong Kong and not go to a mall, a mall okay. even Bruce Lee's old house on yeah. Nathan Road uh, it was the turned into a building yeah it was turned into a mall I mean it's an older mall like from the 80s not one of the new super fancy modern ones yeah. but even Bruce Lee's old home is a mall, is a mall. all right? Okay, right, and right. you got malls everywhere over there, right? I wouldn't say malls are the coolest places to hang out in Hong mm. Kong, right? And obviously, you got lots of touristy spots like the Peak or the Big Buddha and stuff. The mall where we were inside the boot and we were sticking our head up and out of the boot, took and took videos inside a big Timberland boot. It was just like ridiculous looking. And uh, is that the one? It might have been the one. The one, yeah, yeah. That was a dope mall. Yeah, and that mall, and even. 
that mall has uh-huh. replaced another, but that building used to be the Golden Harvest office. That's where Bruce Lee signed wow. his two picture deal with Raymond Chow. And even that is a mall now. <laughs> wow. Everything in Hong Kong is a mall, right? There are lots of great places to hang out in Hong Kong if you, you know, if people like to go and drink and, you know, go out clubbing, go to Lan Kwai oh, Fong, you can stuff like that. Yeah. Nightlife in Hong Kong is great. And, uh, for me, one of my the thing that I miss about Hong Kong the most, besides I was hanging out with kung fu peeps and doing kung fu stuff, uh, is the food. Like, yeah. I just miss the food. Yeah, when so we first spots. got there, I remember we got there in the evening. Mm-hmm. It, it was late the evening, and we went to the spot. We had well, like everything under the sun, but it was it was late. Yeah, but the first night. The first. Yeah, night. we went to a street. We went to a uh, uh, basically Big kind of a Thai pai dong, like a, like street yeah. food. Yeah, yeah. No, oh. it was awesome. It was totally oh. awesome. Actually, I, I, I one of my favorite places to just hang out and chill mm. is at Bay Logan's office. Yeah, in Hong Kong, right? Because we go there to see Bay and also to see Maxivo. Maxivo is the uh, Hong uh, Kong instructor par excellence. Yeah. So. We go there. You guys do some Hong Kong training. You learn some weapons. Learn stuff. I usually teach you guys. It's our type of hanging out, right? Yeah. Right. And at Bay's place, he's got all that Golden Harvest memorabilia because he runs Real East, where he's got all the lobby cards and posters. If you're into like kung fu movies and his books, his libraries, yeah. just listening to him tell all those old stories, yeah. man. I like hanging out there. I can spend hours and hours there <laughs> easily without end. It's so much fun. So probably, I would probably say that's probably my favorite place to hang out when yeah. I'm in Hong Kong, just because it's. It it's it ticks all the boxes for like Hong Hong Kong movie stuff, kung fu stuff, everything. It's all so, um, but yeah, this oh, is making man. me miss Hong Kong. You know, yeah. last last year with the pandemic was the first year I didn't go to Hong Kong in like years. Damn. So yeah, man, I'm Jones. Since you haven't, yeah, back yeah. since wow. since for a long time, right? Ooh. Great question, man. All right, next up we got, hmm, Pedro Delgado from YouTube. How has practicing jujitsu influenced your teaching? Ooh, I that's like a good this question, question. Uh, because it's how it influenced my teaching as opposed to like what I do. Well, what's interesting is I've trained primarily in two different types of two very different types of jujitsu schools, uh, with the Valenti brothers in Miami, mm-hmm. which is uh, very much based on self defense, and they teach in a very organized structured way, which is very similar to how we do it here at City Wing Chun. And then I've also trained under the Henzo banner with Magno Gama. And there it's more just kind of like, uh, go for it. You know what I mean? Like it's the the, the school of hard knocks, right? (laughs) And so one is more like kind of a very structured step-by-step progressive way of learning it. And the other one is kind of like a a learning on the spot kind of thing, right? Mm. And what I learned by practicing in those two different types of schools is the value of both methods of training because it's important, especially for beginners, to have like a structured step-by-step way to learn things. Um, But there's also a lot of value in letting students figure things out kind of in a trial and error kind of thing. So what I learned from training in both of those types of schools is uh, to try to balance both of those. You know, Ultimately, I lean more towards the side of having structure, Mm -hmm. Uh, especially more for the beginners, as senior students get more and more skillful, it, you don't need to to uh, over compartmentalize how they train at that stage. Yeah. But it, it's kind of like there's merits in both styles of teaching, and most people they, they only look at the way they do it, and everything else is shit, right? And so for me, I like to kind of look at both ways and and get an idea of. What are the merits of, of, of doing it both ways? Okay. I, I'm definitely more on the structured side of things, but there is definitely something cool about like, okay, in, in the Henzo style, you know, you do your warm up, and then maybe you drill one or two movements and then it's like, all right, let's just go spar. Uh-huh. I think sometimes it's a little overwhelming for beginners, but I think for senior students, it's it's a great way to do it. And, and it's more like how we do the senior classes and eventually like really high level classes. Like, all right, here are a couple things to work on. All right, guys, now go spar and go work on it, right? Got it. But beginners, you need to kind of hold their hands a little bit okay. more. Okay, right? it's like so that, uh, that, yeah. finding your balance between the both both of the uh, polarities. Exactly. So that's okay. really what I learned from that. Sweet. All right. The Drew Boy 64 from IG. Certain figures are often touted on YouTube as being examples of Wing Chun applied correctly to combat sport. Like Alan or or... Let me try this. Ki la la. I think or that's chi la. Chi la, la, chi la. la. Yeah. Have you seen these? What are your thoughts on them? Uh, I, I don't know the 
chi la la i don't know like i said i don't spend a lot of time watching uh wing chun on youtube i think it's for people who practice wing chun and like as a student somewhere it's like they're the ones watching and consuming all that stuff for the people who actually do wing chun we spend most of our time doing, doing wing chun it. and not spending so much time like <laughs> watching other people I do wing chun the right? last time i seen wing chun on youtube or yeah Instagram i mean for any yeah i really yeah. don't if if you like were to log into my Instagram uh -huh. and see what comes up on my feed, Your it's algorithm. like my algorithm, <laughs> right. right? It's like strength training stuff. It's like uh, stuff to improve athleticism, like mobility and strength and stuff, and uh, MMA and BJJ stuff. Okay, uh, because I don't I don't look at Wing Chun stuff on YouTube at all uh, or uh, Instagram, and also my uh, my public Instagram at Kung Fu Genius. So I don't handle that account. So I don't know what shows up there. I mean, like my private one, right? Yeah. So it's 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 very different. So I don't know the Chi La La guy. I, I might have heard the name or whatever. Alan Orr, I definitely know of him. Okay. I've never met him personally. Uh, I know that he focuses on, M he's a Wing Chun instructor, I believe in the UK, and has adapted it to MMA, mm. which is great. Um, again, it's always the same question. Like if you're not doing MMA, like I, I don't do MMA, all right? I'm a huge MMA fan yeah. and I appreciate MMA and watch MMA as something separate yeah. to what I do. There are a lot of lessons we can learn in traditional martial arts from what we see in MMA, but that doesn't mean that we have to do it. And I have zero interest in learning or doing or teaching people MMA. Even most of my Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu friends who teach Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, uh, sometimes they'll ask me for advice on how to run their schools like because, you know, hey, if a Wing Chun guy can be successful in the age of MMA, then I might know something <laughs> about how to run a school. So those guys will ask me, right? Yeah. And every once in a while, I'll go like, well, you know, you, you do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Do you ever think of maybe adding an MMA class? And some of my jiu-jitsu friends are like, oh, my God, no, because that does nothing but attract meatheads. Uh, and and, and huh. people who, because they're tough fighters, they don't want to pay, and they think it's an honor to train them, so they should go there for free. <laughs> so they would much rather just teach people jiu-jitsu okay. than have to deal with a lot right. of the meatheads who walk into, at least the meatheads who want to compete in MMA. Not like I'm not talking about the executive who wants to do an MMA class at the UFC gym or okay. something like that. We're talking, yeah. you know. So... Um, I, I, I teach traditional Chinese martial arts with a focus on self-defense and a focus on self-improvement, right? And I teach it obviously a little bit differently than the way other people do it. And I have an eye out for, you know, what jujitsu people and other people are doing. But I don't really have interest in modifying Wing Chun for MMA okay. or modifying Wing Chun for combat sport because that's not that that doesn't really reflect the way things in a self-defense situation are going to look. And again, I'm the last guy to say, yo, man, I'll train for the streets. I'll train for the <laughs> ring because I respect the living hell out of people who fight in the ring and, and do sport fighting. And most MMA fighters can 100% handle themselves on the street. All right. I'm, <laughs> I did a whole video. I'm not the guy. Oh, you're just going to poke GSP in the, no. in the eyes and kick him in the balls. And you're going to be able to say, I'm, I'm literally not that guy. All okay. right. So when I say this kind of stuff, it's not a dig on MMA or people who do that or to say MMA is not real because they have five rules. And in Wing Chun, we got no rules, bro. I fight with no rules, bro. Yeah. Uh, it's just that it is very different psychologically. And we're talking about people, have normal jobs they're they're not going to dedicate their entire life to train to fight in the ring so we're teaching people how to you know use things like de-escalation and how to handle the kind of situations that could happen to them in the street and understand when do they have a reasonable chance to defend themselves physically mm -hmm. and when they don't okay all right uh in terms of modifying that for sport i i think it would make more sense to have someone who already has a base in mma and teach that person some Wing Chun tricks and hacks because they already have like a wrestling, kickboxing, yeah. boxing, and jiu-jitsu base rather than teaching a Wing Chun guy and then you have to teach that person how to kickbox, wrestle, and do all that kind of stuff, right? So uh, Alan Orff is very well respected and he does a really good job with that and I think he's he's fantastic. Uh, I, I never I, I never exchange any words. With, uh, uh, my old Howlcast video series, I remember someone had posted it somewhere and he commented on one of them and he was making fun of the fact that I was wearing a... Oh. Uh, uh, a polo in it or something like that like kind of like, real fighters don't wear it like it's, it's literally just so i'm what the howcast series they wanted me to to teach these different topics and they wanted me to look presentable so i wore a polo that had my name on it and you yes. know uh, uh, uh you're not cool bro no you, you wore a polo bro. it felt very high school i'm sure alan Orr is a lovely human being right but that comment felt a little high school oh. 
Uh, and we, okay. we can't we can't even talk about like the executives that come here to train, but you know are in like secret fight clubs and and That's stuff right. like that either. We All secret fight clubs. Yeah, we can't do that. All right. So next up, we got Roberto Roberto S from YouTube. Okay. <laughs> I like this. Please consider having Ron Van Cleef as your next guest. Wow, next guest. Like, not yeah. even like, no. Not three from now. No, next. Next. No, next no. guest. Next. As he was recently on the cover of Wing Chun Illustrated magazine and is an icon. We agree. He is an inspiration to all of us who hope to train and complete, compete. or compete when we are his age. Yo. Yeah, so that was more of a suggestion than a question. Yo. I don't know how that slipped in there. But yeah. hey, Ron, Ron Van Cleef's an old friend of mine. Right. I've known him for many years. He's obviously been around the block. I've had the early, pleasure of meeting him you've through met you. Him. Yeah, yeah. A very early UFC. Uh, he was in one of the very early oh, UFCs. Oh, yes, classic. He fought full contact back in the day, and he Ooh. was in a bunch of movies. He's the Black Dragon, Black right? Dragon. He's even in The Last Dragon. He's actually one of the bad guys. He wears a mask at the end in the, in the disco fight scene. Uh, so he's been around. And the crazy what? thing is like... I didn't know that. So my my wife doesn't like real like you know my wife doesn't come from martial arts background right yeah so you know I'll intro you like we'll, we'll be in Hong Kong and I'll be like oh, today we're gonna meet so and so and so and so is kind of a big deal now for her she doesn't care she's not in the <laughs> martial arts thing right so it literally doesn't matter right so one time uh, you know I had mentioned Ron Van Cleef to her or whatever she didn't really pay too much attention uh-huh. as is typical for my wife not paying too much attention yes, to me right. and. Uh, one time we saw him on the subway. This is years ago when my, my youngest one was really small. Okay. And I was like, hey, Ron, how you doing? And then like, you know, my wife finally had a chance to meet him. And then, you know, we take the subway and it happened that he was heading out in our direction towards Astoria. Cool. So you got to do the ride along. Yeah, so we got to do the ride along. We talked and everything like that. And then we, we got off there. We took a little photo. Like Marie, Marie was really small and stuff. And then, you know, that was that. And then like Carol asked me at that time, like, so, so who is he again? And I'm like, oh, well, he did these movies. And he also learned Wing Chun in the 70s from Sifu Leung Ting. And, okay. and he fought Hoist Gracie in his early UFC. I'm like, dude's been around, right? And she's like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and she's like, okay, okay, okay. She didn't really care, right? <laughs> Until, okay. <laughs> right, right. A few years ago. Her favorite TV show, This Is Us, which is on ABC, I think, right? Super dramatic TV show, right? Okay. One of the characters, uh, he he was adopted. All right, so um, when he's he's black, he was adopted by a uh, a white. He has a white adoptive father, right? Right. And it's one of the episodes. I think it's even in the first season. His father wanted his you know, adopted son to have some black role models in his life, right? Because obviously he's he's not black, so he wants his son to have that, right? Okay. So he takes him to like a local karate dojo, <laughs> and uh, w- w- which was run by a black sensei. All uh, right. And kind of brings him in there, and, and he introduces him to the sensei. And the sensei says to the, the young boy, like, do you want to grow up and be like Ron Van Cleef? <laughs> and they had a photo of Ron Van Cleef on the wall, which oh, is funny nice. because I think... That scene was supposed to be in the 80s, but the photo they had of Ron is like from maybe 15 years ago, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, I'm like such a I'm like, oh, that photo should be oh. should be an older photo of Ron oh, on the wall, right? right. And uh, Carol heard that and she's like, oh, is that is that the same Ron? I'm like, yes. She's like, oh, they mentioned him on This Is Us. And then she's like, I didn't realize he was yes. such a big deal. And I'm like, I told you it was a big deal. <laughs> You know, it's like the boy who cried wolf. Every martial arts person that I introduced to, I'm like, this person's a big deal. So she's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then finally, when someone is a big deal, she's like, right. I'm like, but I told you, right? (laughs) Yes. Okay. Man. And then the next time we saw Ron, which was at Angela Mao's restaurant. I was there for this. She was like, oh, she goes up to him and, you know, and then she's like, oh, and they mentioned you on this. And And then he says to my wife, he goes, you know, your husband, he's like my son. And, and like Carol's like, <laughs> it was so funny, right? And I'm like, well there, well, there you go. You're getting that street cred. <laughs> See, I told you. I love it. Love can, it. I t- can I tell you a funny Ron Van Cleef story? Please do. So I've known Ron for many, many tell years. Tell all right? of them. And uh, one time Ron was doing, um, he was doing something at the Museum of the Moving Image. Uh, you know, our good friend Warrington Hudlin was hosting something. Ron was like the speaker. And uh, they invited me to come, like, you know, to, to, to be there to see Ron, right? So I was like, okay, cool. And I get there and I walk in and I'm like the only white dude in the whole room. 
Ooh. All right. So I walk in and it's never and, happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> I walk in and it was like it just felt like kind of everyone turned around and like looked at me and they were like all of the these super established old school senior African American martial arts from the New York City area. Ooh, and then there's yeah. like and this is me many many years ago, Ooh. you know? Just like, "Hey everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I do kung fu, right? <laughs> right?" Walking in there, right? Yes. And uh Ron finishes, right? And then he comes down and he goes, "Hey everyone. This is my Wing Chun kung fu brother, Alex Richter, right? And they all turn around, he comes, he gives me a hug, and like all those guys they look at me <laughs> and I just remember they go, "Boss." Right, it was like instant I got all I got the instant street cred, oh. right? And I was like, "Wow, I'm so not deserving of this." Your wife wasn't here for this. No, she wasn't. No, this is years before I met her. That's oh, why. Yeah, man. yeah. yeah. They, that's oh, why she man. didn't know. It's like, don't you know? No. Yeah. No, baby, now she knows. Street cred. Now from she this knows. Dude. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's great. All right, great question. That's so dope. Yeah, but I would love to have him on there. We'll we'll get him on soon. Make it happen. All right, he's gonna see this and be like, "Man, I gotta get on that." I hope so. All right, all right. R. M. Puig from YouTube. In the 90s, C4LT, I'm assuming he's speaking of Lung Ting. I hope so, otherwise taught, we're in trouble. <laughs> taught a version of the Siu Tao, or I should say SNT, form. No, you can say Siu Tao, because no it doesn't make I any know, sense. I know, I know, SNT, right? Yeah. All right, TNT, yep. TNT <laughs> form. <laughs> whose notes came from an old document that might have come from Long John. Wow. Its focus was on breathing and stretching the joints. How valid was this, and is it still taught? I like how that question had a commentary track. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's not actually in the question, right? <laughs> he did it. It's all right. You don't need to do it. Apparently, he's, I am now fired. Yeah, he's doing, he's, doing, he's doing your job for you now, right? Yes, baby. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, in the 90s, uh, Sifu Larrington, he... So this Unco happened. Uncovered an, supposedly an older version of the Siunam Tao form, or at least let's say an, an alternate version of the Siunam Tao form. Now, this version of the Siunam Tao form focused a lot on the Yip Fu Cup, the reverse breathing. And it also, the choreography was slightly different. It focused on like extending the joints and, and, and had a lot of stretching movements in there in the Siunam. So it was kind of like an alternate version of the Siunam Tao. Now, according to him, uh, he found when he was doing research, presumably for the book Roots of Wing Chun, although I don't know, it may have had nothing to do with that. He found this document supposedly somehow tied to Dr. Lerung Chan, Lerung Chan being the Si Gong or great grandmaster of, uh, of uh, Sifu Yip Man. Mm. And this was like some 108 point Qi Gong breathing Siu Tao version. And he taught it in Germany in the 90s and then he taught it within his association around that time. And then it seemed that he... Uh, stop doing that at some point, right? Okay. Um, I did have the chance to learn it in Germany, and it's great. It's an alternate version of it. It focuses on moving the joints up. I don't know if, again, the problem with Chinese Kung Fu and history and documents and secret this and secret that is uh, you don't know what the real deal is, okay? So uh, is this something that Sifu Lengtin created? based on something he read in a document, right? Because if, okay. if, if you got an old document that was 100, 200 years old, and you read it, and it showed you how to do the Siunam Tao form a different way, well, it's still up to you to interpret what those writings mean. Yeah. Right? So there's no guarantee that from what he read to what he does was the intended way that it was. Written. Now, I'm not saying that to, to say, it's not a value judgment to say whether that is good or bad. I'm just saying, like, within WT, people... They got so like, oh, it's the secret Siunam Tao from Dr. Lerung. <laughs> like, but it's like, e take it easy. All right. Okay. Hey, 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 hey. Take, take it, it easy. easy. All right. Okay. He found some kind of document. The document alluded to training the Siunam Tao in a certain way. And then he taught something based on that. Okay. Okay. So that's one possibility, right? He saw it and it's his interpretation of what he understood from the document. Uh, the other interpretation, or the other possibility, I should say, which is unfortunately uh, possible, the document could be fake. Now, I'm not saying Sifu Lerengteng faked it, and I'm not saying he knew it was fake. He might believe that it's real. And I'm not saying it's fake either. I'm just saying th yeah, th there's, there's, a there's a wall chart of, of possibilities here, right? right? Anytime someone finds a document <laughs> or something secret or revelatory that comes out of mainland China, 
Okay. All right. Do you remember uh, the CNC Music Factory? Things that make you go hmm. <laughs> was that them? <laughs> that was them. That was them, right? That Things that make you go hmm, <laughs> right? Uh, because now that Yip, the Yip Man movies were popular, oh man. They're finding all sorts of stuff in oh, mainland China suddenly. It's coming like, up out the woods. Yeah, stuff about Leung John, stuff about they found Leung Bik's photo, all these things that no one ever knew. Like, all that stuff is fake. All that stuff is fake. Surfacing. Back in the day, they oh, they suddenly found the Southern Shaolin Temple. Like, shut up. Stop. Mm. Stop. Okay? It's all fake. Okay? And the mainland Chinese government has nothing but incentive to find these things and turn them into tourist spots. All right? I uh, And you have to be very skeptical about these things. You have to go at it like a scientist, like any researcher, or like in a court of law. Mm -hmm. The burden of proof is not, it's not up to me to disprove it. It's up to the person who found it to prove that that thing is legitimate. I don't need to spend, and, and I'm, look, he's saying, I've trained that serum tell form and it's very beneficial. So whether Siva Langton created it, uh, whether it's his interpretation of what he read in documents or whether the whole thing is totally fake. I'll tell you, it's actually extremely beneficial. All right. All right. It's a really benefit. It's a really great way of training the serum tell form. It's like an alternate take on the movements in terms of the historicity. Okay. I, I, I don't have any skin in the game. It's just because uh, I never right. saw this document. And you weren't there when it was written. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I, I am just personally very skeptical about anything that comes out of mainland China in terms of martial arts history revealed, suddenly found, whatever. Uh, that stuff, that all that stuff, that's four striped Adidas, man. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> man, oh man. Gotta love four striped Adidas. All right, username from YouTube. This uh, user's name is actually username. Oh, okay. All right. I'm glad that you clarified that. I'm, you. you have to. You have to clarify these things. That's why else. we got you. You know? Yeah. This is, is my job. I, I say a bunch of stuff and you clarify everything. That's basically your job here. <laughs> <laughs> I am the authentic authenticator. Yeah, you're the voice of reason yeah. in this podcast. Because I'm reasonable. Yes. Hey, Sifu. Hey. I'm, I'm assuming this is one of your students. Here's a no, question. No, don't assume that. People always assume <laughs> if you are a Sifu Q&A. that they should just call you Sifu. That's another thing, too. If someone is your personal Sifu, you call them Sifu. If someone is a Sifu but not your Sifu, usually call them Sifu plus their name. Right. If it's Chinese, Leung Sifu, Wong Sifu, or Sifu Alex, or Sifu Richter, or whatever, right? But people don't understand that. You normally don't say just Sifu to someone who's like I'm assuming he understands. You assume Or that. she understands. But, that's, but, you know, to assume makes an ass out of you and me. But his or oh, her name is username. So So you're assuming that someone that goes by username right. has a full fleshed out understanding of Chinese culture and how to adapt this yeah. into the English language and customs. It's right there. There you go. <laughs> hey Sifu! And as an exclamation point. Here's a question for your next QA. Which is actually this QA. <laughs> See, now your brain is going that way. <laughs> that way. Yeah. You know when the iPhone is loading and that thing is moving like this? Yeah. yeah. That strays brain most of the time. <laughs> he used it. He found the opportunity. All right. Have you ever had to use your WC or general martial arts knowledge outside the dojo? By that, I mean, were you ever in a situation where you needed to defend yourself or the well-being of someone else. Well, I practice WT. I don't practice WC. So I've never used WC. Mm. Nah, just kidding. All right. <laughs> I practice Wing Chun. By the way, WT, Larry Ting system. So when you say WC, I know oh, WC just means Wing Chun. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but, you know, people who use VT, like the Wong Sun Leung lineage, mm -hmm. when you tell them... Your Wing Chun, you, you know, when I address Wong Sun Leung people, I use the VT or, or Moya people use the VT. You use the spelling that people use. Right. I know it's a generic spelling, but it's not up to you to decide how other people spell what they do. All right? That's my answer. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, also, other thing too, Chinese martial arts school, not a dojo. All right? Yeah, we dojo. We want to address that. Definitely. Yeah, dojo is a Japanese word. All right? Do, yeah. like do, like way. And 
you know, like a budo, like the same do, jeet, the same do, do, right? Yeah. By the way, people sometimes think jeet kune do. They think that the do is a Japanese word. In fact, even some of Bruce Lee's students think that. They're like, oh, he took jeet and kun from Cantonese and then do from Japanese. But that's not true. Mm. The the word way in Japanese is do, right? And in Cantonese, it's also do. Okay? <laughs> in Mandarin, it's tao, like in Taoism. That's the same word. But people falsely assume that in Cantonese, like Bruce was using a Japanese word there because that word is identical in both, at least sounds similar in both okay. Cantonese. I'm sure the tone is maybe a little bit different in Japanese, but it's basically D-O. It's like I can all right? go all over the world and say no to people. That's right. And people they'll know. know. <laughs> they'll know. All right? <laughs> no. So... <laughs> So dojo, that first do, it actually means the way. And jo, mm, the mm. character in Chinese, means an area or a place. So it's kind of like a place where the way is trained. Mm -hmm. But this is, and this has a very philosophical meaning behind it. Uh, the Chinese are decidedly a lot less philosophical with the place where they train martial arts. In fact, that's one of the differences when I have students who come from Japanese styles and they come to the school, often what they want to do is when they go onto the training floor, they want to bow to the room. That's a very, uh, or I should say, a much more Japanese style tradition because mm. the Japanese and Japanese martial arts will honor the room where Budo or martial arts are practiced. The Chinese are like, why would you bow to a room? It's just right. a room, it's right? Just a room. So when the Chinese bow, they bow either to like a photo of their late grandmaster on the wall or they bow to each other or they just greet each other using some hand gesture or something God. like that, right? Uh, polite hand gesture, that is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but but, but you, will, you will never see in a Chinese martial arts school that they bow to a room, right? So there's a philosophical difference between the term in Chinese people ask oh, people always ask me all the time when they say like dojo I say actually we don't call it dojo they go what do you call it I go well it's kind of difficult to pronounce right so just call it a school all right yeah. because it's mo gun mo is martial art all right uh -huh. gun is like a place because most people spell like quan or quun but it's not it's gun like g-o-o-n gun, gun right mo gun right okay. and that that's it but it's like the Cantonese phonetics lessons you would need to just just call them Wing Chun school. <laughs> school. My Wing Chun school, all right? <laughs> yeah. Certainly don't call it a dojo. Woo. All right, next question. Okay. Let's do this. All right. Sidi underscore Larby underscore Buyema or Buyema with the two A's from IG. From controversial perspective, just throwing some buzzwords. I'm sure you know the context. Ooh. Laufzetzel, or Laufzetzel, distilled water, Imin Bostepi, kicked out. Sijo Lung Ting, reputation in Hong Kong. Wow, this is interesting. Sifu Tassos and GM, or Grandmaster Lone Kai, Imin B versus William Chung. Sifu Geisen versus Wilhelm Bleck, or Bleach. How KRK handles things in Europe versus LT in Hong Kong, etc. Many thanks. I do know the context. All right, next question. Next up, we got Mark Udo from YouTube. May you explain the Maze logo on the nice T-shirt? That was your T-shirt, the one you were wearing. Oh, this is the guy who wants the T-shirt. Yes. Ah, if never did it before on here for sure i'll found it all right there you go uh so the question was actually i, I remember this because this was on the last ama where you wore the the shirt with the sifu lee's logo on it which yes. is a rip off of sifu learn ting's old logo right oh, oh, oh. in fact the two of them were in a legal battle in hong kong over, over that. the logo yeah, yeah because uh so sifu learn ting was the first one to kind of create that logo what? and Many Westerners, they don't understand it because when you look at it, it's a plum flower, right? Yeah. Which is a very typical symbol in Wing Chun, like uh, for many reasons. The plum flower also is a representation of our footwork. It's also a representation of other things philosophically in Wing Chun. Right. And so the plum flower is, you know, kind of been one of our symbols from day one. And so what Siva Leung Ting did is because when they look at Siva Leung Ting's IWTA, his International Wing Chun Association logo, they see like, they think it's like a maze or it's some kind of weird, I don't know, labyrinth or something like that but okay. actually what it is it's because it's five petals in the plum flower mm -hmm. and each of those petals is a different chinese character and the chinese characters were compressed 
into a point to fit into each of those petals. So it's like you take the Chinese character that's this way and then you compress it into a V at the bottom and then you, you put it in a wheel of five petals. And so the original Leung Ting one was Leung Ting Kun Sut Gun, which is Leung Ting Martial Arts School. Mm -hmm. And the reason why he did that is because the IWTA, that's his worldwide association, the International Wing Chun Association. And then the five petals inside represented the mother school of the IWTA, which was the Leung Ting Martial Arts School. So that's the hub. That's the first school. And then the association grew out of it. So that the idea was it was like kind of wow. his mother school is the logo on the inside, which is the hub of his International Wing Chun Association. Right. So if you if. People in WT who don't know that, if you look at it again, you'll actually see that it's five Chinese characters compressed into a point. Now, uh, Sifu, Sifu Lei Yun Tim left Sifu Lei Yun Ting many, many years ago and straight up, I love my Sibak to death, but he straight up ripped off Jack Sifu Lei Yun Ting's uh, yeah. logo, right? And changed it instead of, obviously, instead of the characters inside being Lei Yun Ting Kun Sut Gun, he made it like Lei Yun Tim Wing Chun. All right, so Lei Yun Tim's Wing Chun, right? And uh, Sifu Lang Ting tried to sue him for that, right? <laughs> and it was so funny because that even made it in the news, the Chinese newspapers here in New York. Yo. I remember years ago, one of my Chinese students came and was like, hey, Sifu, uh, Si Gong is in the newspaper. The because newspaper. he's like, Yeah, and they brought it to me and it was like him and Lee and Tim going at it, right? What? And uh, Sifu Lang Ting went to, you know, to, I guess to sue Sifu Lee for copyright infringement and he lost because Sifu Lang Ting only claims to own the trademarks on these things, but he doesn't actually have it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're the first person to trademark something, you sometimes get what's known as a common law trademark, even if you didn't officially trademark it because you were the I've first. Heard of this, yeah. But the problem is that he had, he didn't, I think he didn't even have a lawyer because he always just goes kind of balls first, like, <laughs> whatever, I don't need a lawyer. And uh, uh, I know everything about, I know everything court. about, you know, trademark registration, right? Yeah. I'm a Wing Chun teacher, I know everything, right? And uh, it was easy for Sifu Lei on Tim's side to prove that the plum flower in general is so generic and used among all the other Wing Chun styles that you cannot now claim something. Had Sifu Lei Ting actually trademarked it in the 70s, right? Hmm. Because the reason why he never actually trademarked these things is because you got to pay a lawyer some money to do it, right? Yeah. Had he done it in the 70s, it would have cost him very little. And he'd be able to win all of these things, including the WT wow. spelling. But he never actually did it. He So people think like, and it's funny because a lot of the rebels who left in Europe, they use like these alternate spellings because they believe that WT is trademarked to Leung Tang. So they spell T-Z-U-N-G-T-T-J-S-G-U-N because they think they have to change. And it, they don't have to at all. And they come up with all these dumbass spellings. <laughs> and it's not even remote because they, they don't want WC... Because WC is water closet, meaning toilet, right? Yeah. They want to keep the WT, right? But they they think that the TSUN thing is trademarked, but even in Europe, it's not. So they make these alternate spellings based on a. You can look it up. You can literally go on on different on websites for the U.S. Patent Office, and you mm. can see they do not have a trademark on it. Wow. And this is because Sifu Leung Ting, quite frankly, waited way too long. And when he finally had to dispute it uh, because of ex-students using it, it was already too late. Damn. So because he just didn't want to spend the money Damn. when it was time. Damn, dude. Damn. It's like when I was a rapper, I was writing songs and I'll just mail the song to myself because I didn't want to spend money. Yeah, that was a myth, <laughs> by the way. That's not how that works. Yeah, it doesn't hold up in court. Yeah. All right. Let's go to my man R.M. Puig from IG. Oh, I think it's the second question from this guy. But he did one on YouTube and one from IG. That's how we got under the radar there. Oh, smart man. Smart man. Good work. Good work. Oh, smooth. Smooth criminal. All right. Why is Gua Sao almost non-existent in the IWTA slash or dash NAS NAS? They've been learning from LT for years. Uh, so the question here is, uh, Guo Sao, the Chi Sao sparring method, why don't you see, because there's a very specific method in Hong Kong, like how to teach this in the, the so-called violent Lat Sao, Da Lat Sao, Guo Sao, all these kind of things. And this is yeah. what I learned from Sifu Lao. Mm -hmm. Before I learned from Sifu Lao, I had not even seen this. And the truth is that Sifu Lao Ting doesn't really teach this in the seminars. He claims to do it sometimes. So the, the problem is, in order to learn this, you actually need an instructor to do it with you. Mm -hmm. Because they can kind of, 
build up the sparring progressively and start to build you up. It's really a method that is taught from Sifu to student. It's not a method that is easily taught in a group setting. All right. Although there are ways to do it. Obviously, we do it here. Mm -hmm. But originally, it was essentially the chi cell sparring between the teacher and their student and how you get the student to be able to use these things when there's, you know, uh, heavier pressure and all and all sorts of variables. We're not talking about doing a chi cell drill. We're not talking about doing some repetitive chi cell practice. We're talking about actual sparring. And in the format that Wing Chun was taught at in the 70s and 80s, mainly through seminars, it wasn't really possible for Sifu Learning Ting to kind of interface with the individual students and pass this method on because it's really taught from teacher to student. It doesn't work well in seminars. And so that's all I can say. I don't know how these guys learned in the 80s. Uh, okay. I, well, I do know how they learned in the 80s because people who were there told me. But I, I still, uh, I can only go on what they said. And it's very clear why they didn't learn it because they didn't do it. All okay. right. That's all I'm going to say about that. All right. Next up, we got SC. I have a Bruce Lee related question, which you can take with a grain of salt. I take all of these with a grain of salt. <laughs> <laughs> I've read about him fighting a Thai boxer. Let's assume that it's true. How would he have fared against the Thai low kick? Uh... I don't know. I mean, all these kind of speculations. It always seems like my dad can beat up your dad. Or what if my dad <laughs> fought Superman? Who would win, right? I mean, oh, I wait, don't know. There's more to this question. Well, let's, let's answer the first one here yeah. first. right? So uh, I've also heard about him fighting a Thai boxer. It was on the set of Big Boss. But uh, I, there's no reason to believe that that's true. Mm -hmm. All right, I, I, don't, I don't think that that's true. Because first of all, when he was on the set of Big Boss, he was on a set where he was not very well liked. All right, because remember, he came in to replace the the first star, James Tien. Yeah. So he was already, and, and most of the guys who were there, they were already working on the film. And they were like, oh, James Tien is a star. And then suddenly this guy, Bruce Lee, come, oh, no, no, this guy's going to be the guy. So a lot of the people on the set, they, they didn't really like Bruce Lee. Okay. Damn. And Bruce Lee had a very contentious relationship with the director, Lo Wei. And it was filmed in Pak Chong, Thailand. Okay, and there's some people that said, oh, like so one of the extras was a Thai boxer. And even Bruce Lee said in the um, phone conversation with Dan Lee, he said, oh, the bantamweight champion was was on the set of Big Boss or whatever. Had they actually fought, all right, given the number of people who hated Bruce Lee on that set, everyone would know about it. Mm -hmm. Everyone would know about it, all right? And probably the people, and, and if Bruce Lee won, they probably would have said he lost or they would have begrudgingly said that he won. All right. Wow. If Bruce Lee had lost, they all would have said that he lost because they were, I'll say at least more than half of the set of that film was hostile towards Bruce Lee. Wow. So that's the reason Shit. why this constant recurring story about Bruce and a Thai boxer on the set of Big Boss. I go, Bruce was surrounded by hostiles. If, if this was true, everyone would be talking about mm. it. And they're not. OK. Um, and also, there were other opportunities for Bruce to tell this. He didn't tell to anyone, not even in a private recorded phone conversation where he didn't even know he's being recorded, right? So I, I, I don't know about that, right? The thing is that, you know, people didn't know about the low... People outside of Thai boxing, which was most martial artists back then, didn't know about the low kick. Even American kickboxing back then... American kickboxing was based off karate and didn't use the, the low kick. And Rick Rufus, the older brother of Duke Rufus, who's a very famous MMA uh, striking coach, like for Anthony Pettis and those guys. Okay. He very famously had a match, I think it was in the late 80s, where when Thai boxing came on the scene, the American style kickboxers, they were like, that's a bunch of BS. The low kick is a bunch of BS. And mm. they didn't really believe that it was effective. And Rick Rufus had a match with a Thai boxer in the late 80s. And the Thai boxer kicked the living crap out of his legs. And they didn't even know how to defend it because it wasn't part of the thing that they did, right? So he got the crap kicked out of his legs. And after that, to Rick Rufus's credit, he's like, okay, we need to learn this. We need to start yeah. doing this now. He didn't, he didn't as many people like double down and say, no, it's still BS while he limps out of the ring, right? Uh, and so <laughs> now they are like some of the most famous, you know, Thai style and striking coaches you have in MMA, right? And that was in the 80s. So even in the late 80s, that whole thing about like, oh, the low kicks was still pretty novel, right? So if we talk about the 70s, mm -hmm. if you weren't actually doing Thai boxing, I don't think you even would have thought about that. The, the only people who are kicking the legs, as far as I understand, uh, in Bruce's circle would have been 
the Wing Chun people doing like the straight kick to the knee, and okay. which by the way is also making uh, emerging a lot in MMA these days. The straight yeah. side kick to the knee, the the rear leg front kick to the front knee, like that kind of. Those were the kind of leg kicks to the shin to the knee that you had back then. But the idea of like kind of cutting down wasn't like a thing. So the question is, well, if Bruce Lee hadn't seen it, if that wasn't part of the zeitgeist of martial arts in that time period, well, how would he fare against it? And the truth is, I have no idea. I don't know. Okay. Mm. Are we talking about him fighting someone who's a similar size to him? Right. Because I think that Bruce's evasive footwork and his explosiveness could have helped him get around. He probably would have struggled with it a little bit because he didn't see it before. Okay. But I don't think that if he was fighting someone who was about his size, um, I think with his elusive lead and moving back in the sidekick and stuff, I think he probably would have done okay. But if the guy was bigger than him or whatever, okay, maybe it's a different story. But the thing is, I don't know. I mean, this is pure speculation. I, I can't even begin to answer this question, right? I, I also think the second part of the question just basically talks about the the low tie kick being uh, virtually unknown. Yeah, basically, that's the rest of the question right there. Uh, was right. there any technique or tactic in Bruce Lee's era he could have used or whatever? So um, it's possible, all right? We, you know, there are... We have seen even in MMA nowadays. Now, mind you, when you talk about MMA, you're not necessarily talking about a Thai boxer. You're talking about people who also do Thai boxing, right? Mm. But um, there are a lot of very slick counters nowadays to the low kick that it, uh, involve evasive footwork. And sometimes they involve closing the gap with punches like, like a left hook, yeah. for example. And a lot of Thai boxers obviously do stuff like that too. So uh, there were things that were around back then that people are doing nowadays to great success, but they're doing it nowadays to great success because they actually have experience with it, right? Whether they would have known to do that back then, I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. And it, But it's always this kind of thing of trying to compare people outside of their time periods, right? Which you also cannot compare Helio Gracie's jujitsu to like, uh, you know, of the 50s and 60s to like Gordon Ryan nowadays. I mean, the, 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 this is a completely different world. Wow. Time period versus time period. Right. All right. Last one, huh? Last one. We made it. And the last one is Namanto or Namanto from YouTube. Hi, Alex. Do you think that the work of strengthening the tendons of the praying mantis can be beneficial for Wing Chun punches or for boxing and more particularly bare knuckles boxing? That's a good question. I mean, I, I talked about how I, I did the praying mantis a few years ago and the, right. the, the focus is on tendon training. It's, the training is very arduous, very painful to practice. Some of the most painful Kung Fu I've ever had. Um, whether it's beneficial for the punches. So obviously I only trained, I trained it for a short time, but I trained it very intensively. So the truth is I'm not the person to answer that. All right. There, there are people out there who they dedicate their entire life. They do as much Southern Mantis as I do Wing Chun. They're yeah. probably way better to ask than I am. Right. Uh, I can't, I did it for about two weeks, but I trained many <laughs> hours every day. I mean, I did it extremely intensively. Okay. Um, but, I barely even tipped my dipped my toe into Southern Praying Mantis, right? Yeah. I mean, I did a, I would do a few hours. I would do like one or two hours of private training, and then I would do the group class, which is about two hours, and I do that a few times a week, and it's mm -hmm. very intensive. And you're not training lots of different things. You're training a few things. We do again and again and again and again. It's super, super wow. arduous. The benefit I felt from that type of training was in my grip strength, and in the power of my bridge, when I send my hand forward and it runs into someone's arm, like that kind of power. Okay. Uh, I didn't notice like uh, an increase in my punching power so much as like uh, my, br let's say, bridge strength, although it's a very obscure thing for people who don't do Chinese martial arts, <laughs> and grip strength. Mm. All right. Uh, and things like jutsu, short, snappy type things. Right. Um, so I felt that I don't, I don't know if it helped me in the punching arena right it definitely made me stronger in general and if you're stronger and more athletic that kind of makes you better at everything right athleticism is the tide that raises all the ships in your martial arts technical game got it all right you can have all the ships <laughs> but you need to have that athleticism to bring it up right so i would say that southern mantis raised a certain part of my athletic skills that definitely helped my wing chun okay uh maybe more than on the technical side right uh in terms of bare knuckle boxing, I have no idea. I never did bare knuckle boxing. I don't mm -hmm. know the requirements of bare knuckle boxing. Bare knuckle boxing, normally they still have the wrist wraps. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. That's very difficult for me to ask. You should ask uh, uh, 
you, uh, P Paige Van Sant, she does bare knuckle boxing nowadays. Yeah. yeah, that was a lot of fun. Can't wait to do that again. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that episode, our second Ask Me Anything episode. Now, for our next one, we need questions. So go ahead and write them in the comments below. Anything you want me to talk about, training methods, history, all sorts of stuff, we'll answer it, or I'll try to, on the next Kung Fu Genius Ask Me Anything episode. And don't forget to follow us on Patreon. You can follow us for as little as $5 a month and get access to episodes early as well as exclusive content there. The website is right here. Check it out. It's also in the description below. And I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a Kung Fu genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Seagung. And I produce masters. You surpass us. Your Kung Fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt. Alex Richter, always the Yeah, don't get me riled up, all right? Stop talking about Take it easy, all right? Take it easy. <laughs> hey, hey, all right? hey. Take it easy. It feels like my fucking arm has been cut off by a lifesaver. All right, peeps. On today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius. All right, peeps. On today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will continue to the. We'll answer more we'll viewer answer questions. More viewer questions. Did you we'll even answer. look at it, or you're just like? I did. Kinda. I'll just buy osmosis. I just. I just know scanned it. it. Yeah, scanned it. Scam. Yeah. Scan likely. All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will answer more viewer questions. Lots of gems, lots of... Context. <laughs> Yoda and Palpatine <laughs> reference might not be about you. My guy. My guy. Lots of gems, lots of context, lots of the Yoda Jeez. and Palpatine. I was about to say Yoda versus Palpatine, like... like. <clears throat> Revenge of the Sith. Of the shit. shit. Revenge of the shit. That's what that movie yeah. should be called. Ah. No. <laughs> <laughs> she was alive. <laughs> I got the high ground, bro. Don't do it. The genius will answer more viewer questions. Lots of gems. <laughs> Why are y'all looking at each other like because that? Because your emphasis is always a bit off. It's almost like William and Shatner's doing it. Yes, you know? exactly. Emphasis. <laughs> yeah. Answer more. Fascist. Viewer questions. Oh. Lots of gems. Lots of genius. Let's put the emphasis on words like of. Uh. All right, peeps. On today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius. Whoa. I didn't say anything. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Uh. Like the Yoda and Palpatine reference might not be about you, my guy. All right, peeps. On today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will answer more viewer questions. Ooh, that was weak. Yeah. That, that was, was weak. That was like... Yeah, I, I couldn't I even let to, you continue I dropped on. It it's like, it. no, yeah. yeah. Lots of gems. Lots of Palpatine! <laughs> the Yoda and Palpatine episode might not be episode. about you, my guy. Episode. Yoda and Palpatine reference. Yes. Yeah, I did a Yoda and Palpatine episode. Episode. Wait, wait, yeah, wait. I'm now a Star Wars geek. And when does it come out? What, huh? now? When does it come out? Yeah, exactly.